Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The civil war in Yemen has taken a dramatic new turn as Saudi-backed forces try to take the key rebel-held port of Hedaya. Back aid agencies say that the coastal city provides a vital route for food and medicine and that millions of people are at risk of starvation if goods cannot pass through it. Tonight, the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson called on all sides to prioritise the protection of civilians and respect humanitarian law. Our foreign affairs correspondent Jonathan Rugman has this report. Before dawn, Operation Golden Victory began. Saudi coalition troops advanced on Hodeida after fighter jets and warships had bombed Houthi targets first. Yemeni forces are taking the lead, backed by Emirati and Sudanese troops. The Arab force is believed to number over 20,000. They're moving in from the south towards the city's airport and they say the time to negotiate with the Shia Houthis who occupy the city has run out. We're heading towards Hodeida to liberate it from the Shia filth, says this Yemeni fighter. We tell our brothers not to join the Houthis who support Iran, says another, standing beside a dead body, or this will be their fate. A few days ago, the Houthis filmed this attack on what they said was a Saudi military vehicle. They're fighting outside Hodeida, knowing that if they lose the port, they also lose their supply of food and weapons. Though last week, their leader tried to sound relaxed. They can start a battle here, he said, but they can't win it, and this childish tactic will fail. Aid agencies fear that up to half a million people could be displaced by fighting for this city and that aid deliveries from the outside world could be cut off. The Houthis control most of Yemen's population centers, including the capital. But in the last month, the Saudi-led coalition has advanced towards Hodeida. The port is Yemen's primary artery for food and aid, supplying 80% of Yemenis. The coalition claims the Houthis use it for arms smuggling and that capturing it will force them to sue for peace. But aid agencies warn that could leave 8 million people at risk of starvation. The port of Hodeida feeds two-thirds of Yemen. We have 29 million people in Yemen, of which 8 million are already at risk of famine. 8 million people, even before this morning, were already at, at risk of starvation. If the port is closed, even for a day, this means that these people will die. I'm very lucky to be here. The UN's new special envoy for Yemen is no longer so lucky, because the peace plan he was about to deliver could now lie in ruins. And the UK's former international development secretary told me it's time to stop siding with the Saudis and to push for a ceasefire. Every single humanitarian body, every single agency in the world has urged the Saudi coalition not to attack Hodeida for the reasons I've set out. It is militarily lunatic, it is probably a breach of international humanitarian law, and it will cause enormous suffering and death amongst hundreds of thousands of poor Yemenis. We are on the wrong side. We shouldn't be on any side. We hold the pen at the United Nations. We have an obligation, a duty to neutrality to try and bring the ceasefire about and get the negotiations going. But effectively, we are part of the coalition and we need to distance ourselves from that. But consider this. The UK has licensed well over £4 billion of arms sales to the Saudis and their defence minister, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, since the bombing of Yemen began three years ago. And while British firms arm the Saudis, British taxpayers are helping keep the victims of this war alive with aid. It's a moral quagmire and one which seems set to deepen if this coalition advance makes the world's biggest humanitarian crisis even worse. Jonathan Rugman reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to Maritza Relano, UNICEF's resident representative in Yemen via the internet, and I started by asking her if UNICEF was feeling the effects of today's assault on Hodeida port. 
Of course, we feel the effects because we know the effect of any attack to Hodeida would have to the children of Yemen. Any attack to Hodeida will have an impact not only on the population of Hodeida, which is uh, 600,000 people, half of them children, but also indirectly on the entire population of the country, because as you know, 80% of the of the goods and the humanitarian aid, they come through the port of Hodeida. So any attack to the port will have a direct impact on the humanitarian assistance that we are providing to almost 11 million children. So of course, we are feeling the, the impact. Do you have any awareness of what sort of protection is being offered to the children? Or is it simply a, a, an assault on the whole city? We don't know exactly what is going to happen. However, we are appealing to the parties in the conflict to please preserve, of course, uh, human lives, civilians, children, and also those infrastructure that are essential, such as the health centers, the schools, and the water infrastructure. Ms. Reliano, how long have you been in Yemen yourself working? Almost three years. And in those three years, have you seen anything improve or has it simply got worse and worse? Well, obviously everything is going worse because at the beginning the families were able to cope with the, with the initial months of, uh, of conflict. Then they started losing, of course, their jobs. Now the teachers have not been paid for almost two years. The health workers, there are no new jobs coming up. The families don't have any savings, and of course, the, the poverty is increasing to reach almost 80% of the population. If you could speak to the United Nations tonight, I mean, what would you ask? I would ask all the parties in the conflict to please sit and negotiate, because it's not, it's not a very feasible uh, solution to the conflict to go through the military route. We have to find peaceful solutions because otherwise millions of children might lose their life. It's very important that we preserve the life of the most vulnerable. Ms. Reliano, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. It is the day that millions of Yemenis prayed would not come. Eight million are already at risk of starvation in the country which has been ripped apart by war for the past three years. And last night's pro-government forces, aided by the Saudi-led coalition, began a bombardment from air and sea of the coastal city Huvidaya, where most of the aid arrives for people in the rebel-held areas. According to the coalition, the strikes were launched after the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels ignored a deadline to withdraw. The legitimate Yemeni government was forced into exile by the Houthis, who were in control of the northwest of the country. So what chance is there for a return of the saudi bank government? Nawal Amagahi Agafi has reported regularly from Yemen on the conflict for the BBC. Here is her report. Houthi rebels watching and waiting, ready for the fight. They know how important this port is to Yemen and perhaps the rebel group's grip on this fractured country. Today, a Saudi-led coalition geared up for an assault on Hodeida to the west of the country. The port is a vital harbour in rebel territory. It's the main artery bringing in food, fuel and aid to the country and a lucrative financial hub for the rebels. It's also where some believe Iranian weapons are smuggled into the country. But for the people, things are desperate. Two years ago, I met with Dr. Ashwag Muharram, who showed me people starving in Hudaydah. Today, she told me, she fears things are going to get worse. We're suffering from the uh, starvation and, and poverty and uh, lack of uh, medical su uh, supply. And from the army processes now, to they inform us it will be, become a worse. And we, we, I think in Hudaydah we're waiting to die. So who are the Houthis? And how are they able to consolidate so much power? The Houthis are a theological movement, which is an insurgency, simply an insurgency uh, that was able to take control over Sana'a in uh, September 2014. And since then, it uh, grew up uh, because they used a, a specific political vacuum in the country to uh, run um, the, a parallel uh, military structure in the country. Now, 
The Houthis are in control of the most populated parts of the country. The president of Yemen, Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi, fled to neighboring Saudi Arabia. In March 2015, a ten-nation coalition led by Saudi Arabia and backed by the US and UK started bombing Yemen. And as people were running out of the windows. Since then, I've witnessed some of the horrors of the war. The fighting, the bombing, and then the starvation. The risk is that this new offensive will block the port and much-needed supplies won't make it in. The UN describes Yemen as having the, the worst humanitarian crisis in, in the world. You've got something like 22.2 million people out of a population of 27.4 million people in need of some sort of humanitarian assistance. And the UN reckon, reckons around 8 million people who are, are living hand to mouth, who are on the verge of, of starvation. So if you have a really big shock to the system, those 8 million people, they're worried, could be pushed over the edge into, into real starvation. We could see a real famine-like condition in some parts of, of the country. The offensive presents a problem for the British government. They could hold some responsibility if things go badly wrong. Whatever unfolds in the next few days and weeks on the ground, the MOD will be keeping a very close eye. The UK government may not be a part of the coalition, but it's one of its main supporters. They provide training, they have personnel in the command and control centre in Riyadh, and they're also one of the main suppliers of the billions of pounds of advanced weapons that have devastated Yemen. The British government has been cagey about this attack. They've urged restraint, but some Conservative MPs support the offensive. It is absolutely vital that this coalition, unanimously supported by the UN Security Council, uh, is able to uh, effect the relief of suffering in the Yemen. It is the Houthis uh, and their forces who are in illegal rebellion against the former uh, established order uh, in the Yemen, and we shouldn't forget that. And the Saudi coalition have an incredibly difficult political and military task to take control of the Yemen for, uh, for the people of the Yemen and for the, on behalf of the international community. The coalition believe the Hudayda offensive can be completed quickly and effectively. But that's what they said when they began this war, which is now in its fourth year. If this offensive is prolonged, it could turn what's already a humanitarian disaster into a catastrophe. Nawal al Magafi. Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry. Emily Thornberry, first of all, what is your initial reaction to what's going on in Hudayda? It is a disaster and it's been going on for years and there is no military solution to this. There can only be a political solution and we have an important role in this. These are our bombs that are being used by the Saudi Arabians. The, what is now happening is that the port, which is the port where 80% of the food comes in, has been, has been closed by the Saudis in the last couple of days and people are going to starve. Now there are allies and we have a role in saying no, enough, stop this. And furthermore, we hold the pen in the Security Council. It's our responsibility to put a, put, to put a peace proposal on the table. And we have not been doing that. And, we, have been, and we, should have been, we should have done that two years ago. There was a draft and it got pulled. And we are simply not stepping up in the way that we the should. Sa the Saudis and the coalition are saying that uh, they've exhausted all political pressure and negotiations and the Houthi won't Well, that's just not true. Because Martin Griffiths, who's the, who's the United Nations um, special representative, is somebody who's very well thought of. Everyone I've spoken, spoken to about him all holds him in high esteem. And he was next week going to put forward his blueprint before the Security Council. And he has said himself that this attack, this attack on this port with a quarter of a million people in it, is, the, is the, effectively the end to any peace process. So would a Labour government stop all arms sales to Saudi? It's our policy to stop arms sales to Saudi Arabia. We've had that policy for the last three years. And, and the reason for it is because we believe that there has to be an investigation into the way in which those arms have been used over the last few years. Even though the, 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 it's that industry 
We are the third biggest exporters of defence. It's a massive income to the UK, and you know the Saudis will go straight, and the, and the Russians would supply the same weapons. So what I would say is this, is that all the people in the arms industry that I've spoken to want to do it in accordance with the law, and, in, and it is my view... But Theresa May says it is in accordance well, with the law, and she also says that you have said in the past that you're not against the arms sales if they are used for legitimate purposes. Yes. And, and using them in a densely populated area like this, closing down a port, port like this, on the face of it, looks like war crimes. It looks like a breach of international law. And there has been a court case, it's the subject to appeal, and it would be very interesting to see what a court would say now. Because in the past, whenever they've bombed civilians who are getting married or funerals or things like that, they say, oh, that's a mistake. But this is not a mistake. This is a deliberate policy to, to, to engage in this port mm -hmm. where there are so many civilians there and where, on the face of it, there will be the reckless use of force where civilians will be killed. They've leafleted and told the civilians to get out of the way. How can they get out of the way? Let me turn now uh, to Brexit. I'm sure uh, that you heard uh, Nick Watt earlier. Um, tonight, one shadow minister and four ministerial aides uh, resigned over Brexit, um, partly because of the, well, obviously only because of the EA vote. Uh, you're just as split as the Tories over Brexit. Well, we're not. You see, what we want to do is we want to be in a customs union and we want to negotiate, we want to negotiate a free trade agre agreement with, the, with Europe and we want to put jobs at the, at the front and centre. Now, the disagreements, and there are disagreements, is exactly how to go about doing that. But and Keir some Starmer people says you're hopelessly split. You yes, must agree with the, Keir Starmer. But, the, but the, the, what you? I'm saying, the disagreements is what the, what the vehicle is that we use in order to get there. Okay. And as we get closer to, to running out of time, people are saying, let's go into the EEA because that's a safe haven. But on the figures, mm -hmm. it's, it's how you get, exactly how you get to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Nick Watt was talking about the magic figure of 14. Yeah. Uh, 14 uh, Tory rebels, well, three voting against, three, 11 abstaining. If all of uh, Labour voted one yeah. way with the rebels, we'd be able to be yeah. in the EEA. And there's okay. a lot of people, and actually, there's a lot of people, including trade unions, to think if that's the measure it takes for you to get to the position you want to get to. But the problem is that Jeremy Corbyn doesn't want that. Well, the problem is, is that there are a very large number of my co colleagues who believe the EEA, and they're right, would not allow us to change the rules in relation to immigration, because that's one of the four pillars. And they would not ever vote for the EEA. So, actually, what we have wanted to do, as we've said, we want to have a British-style agreement with the, with the European Union. We want to be in a customs union. We need to change the rules on immigration. And we're united on that. Surely and the government are the ones a... who are not. But, you know, it's simple maths. That's the key figure. If you could get there, surely it doesn't matter. It's the ends justifies the means. Get there. Isn't that not what you Listen, want? Listen, if we had another 15 MPs, we'd be in government. And actually, we'd be able to go along and negotiate on the basis on which I've put it. And we wouldn't be in this sort of situation that we're in now, where the government can't even agree amongst themselves what it is that they want to go to Europe and negotiate on. But Keir Starmer says you can't agree either. Well, we can agree on the basis on which I've said. It's just a question of what the mechanism is. And in the end, we're the opposition. Thank you very much, Emily Thornbury. Not at all. I've been